Perfect. Okay, so welcome. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, I'm ecstatic to welcome uh, Dr. Nikolaychuk um, for her presentation, Living in the Space Between. Um, we were talking before the presentation, and it was back in uh, September that we were first connected um, and discussed kind of the uh, theme of this presentation and what would happen today. And so it's really great that the day has finally come that she is going to give her presentation, and it's going to be absolutely wonderful. So I'm glad you are all here. Um, since this is the last session of our season two, I just wanted to go through and talk a little bit about what happened this year for Obliquity and what to expect moving forward. So um, in our second year, we hosted six different speakers um, and we had almost a presentation a month and we had presentations varying from talking about the intersection of graphic art and medicine to toy design, um, from individuals talking about their experience with music and coping, uh, to a arts professor talking very specifically about poetry. Um, we had discussions on sound and ecology, and today um, we're going to talk more about palliative care and creative aspects found, um, found there. So I wanted to start off by saying um, we see you and also that uh, obliquity really wouldn't be what it is today without all of the phenomenal people who have joined in on our workshops. Um, I was again talking um, before the presentation and I think the vision, one of the biggest visions for obliquity was really creating this interdisciplinary space and this space where everyone is welcome. Um, we really value every single uh, perspective and opinion and view that's brought into each of these sessions through the discussions. And uh, I can tell, and I've gotten feedback that you all can tell um, how much of a gift it is to be a part of these sessions and to hear everyone's um, thoughts. And so thank you so much for your time. It really means the world to me and uh, we really couldn't do this without you. So I wanted to say thank you. And then moving forward. so. Obliquity is not over. We're going to keep trucking on and we are getting ready for our third season. And so before I give you some details about what to expect for next year, I wanted to talk a little bit about our, our team. Um, and so we are founded by women and we are women operated. And I also just wanted to mention um, it was Holy or the Festival of Colors on Sunday. And so I found this uh, this uh, slide deck with that theme. And so I just wanted to use it in, uh, in an ode to Holy that was uh, this past Sunday. So first off, we have Stephanie Dahmer. Uh, she is our junior curator. She's a second year uh, med student. She's also on the call. I can see Steph. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I created these little uh, pictures on International Women's Day to celebrate our team. And so I asked the team one thing that they were proud of, uh, proud of accomplishing. And so for Stephanie, it was that her first research project was illustrating and writing a graphic novel. Also, Stephanie is the brilliant artist behind our logo. She drew that and put it together for us. And it is one of my favorite things on planet Earth. So thank you, Stephanie. Uh, our newest member of the Obliquity team is Ashika Patel. She is a first year medical student at Western uh, University, the Schulich Medical School. And she actually reached out to me after coming to one of the earlier presentations this year. Um, and she wanted to uh, create an Obliquity chapter at Schulich. And so we worked together um, for her to put that together over at Western University. And one of the things that she expanded was creating a book club um, over there. And uh, in addition, she encourages her members to come to these larger workshop series sessions as well. And Ashika was proud that she won first prize for her rapid fire presentation at Sick Kids Neonatal Research Day. Um, we also have Dr. Pamela Brett McLean. So she's our senior advisor and also the director of the Arts and Humanities in Health and Medicine program at the University of Alberta. And in 2018, uh, in collaboration with two other individuals, she helped establish the Canadian Association for Health Humanities. And so that's a pretty big deal. And we are so excited that Dr. Brett McLean is a part of our team because she is an icon in the health humanities. And so she's been instrumental in moving obliquity forward. 
And this is me, I'm Manisha. Um, I'm the founder and senior curator for Obliquity. Um, one of the things that I'm proud of is earlier this year, I wrote and recorded a podcast for PEDS cases um, on trauma-informed care, toxic stress and resiliency in uh, children. So season three. So the biggest thing that's gonna happen in season three is that we're actually gonna begin the season early, given that we're gonna stay on an online platform until um, told that we can do otherwise. We're also expanding. So there's gonna be 10 to 12 sessions total and we have nine speakers that have already been scheduled for next year. Um, we also wanna create these workbooks for participants. And so these will be finalized before uh, the presentations start. And the vision is to get you a hard copy or electronic copy that you'll have um, before the season starts. And that way it will promote some interaction and also give you a little memento of the sessions. And so again, I just wanna reiterate um, that we could not have done this without you and all of your support. Um, this, I'll put this back up at the end. It's uh, the scan me as a feedback form that again, I'll bring back up at the end. Um, but without further ado, I will go back to this first thing before I stop sharing my screen, but um, I will allow Dr. Nikolaychuk to take over and begin her presentation and I, I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Manisha, and uh, very, I'm very grateful to be here this evening. I um, am incredibly impressed with the caliber of speakers this session over the last year. I have had a chance to listen to all of them. I attended, I think, one of the sessions, but I have listened to every recording and have uh, really, uh, as I was telling Manisha before we got together, how impressed I am with the diversity of topics, the sensitivity to such um, important areas that often we're not exposed to in our normal kind of training settings. And so it's a wonderful initiative. And I, again, want to thank Manisha and your team for, for uh, pursuing this. I think it's, I'm so glad that you're going to continue to, to do it as well. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I will be sharing with you. And I am um, more than willing to share that if anybody would like a copy of it after. I also have no uh, need to go through it all. What I'm more uh, interested in is being able to make sure that you have the time for a discussion and for uh, any kinds of questions you might have. So I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Feel free to ask uh, questions as we go along. And I would be more than uh, interested in hearing about some of your own experiences. And so I'm going to start, uh, I will start with the PowerPoint and uh, we'll, we'll move along through it. And there are a few places where we can stop and uh, particularly I've, I've set up for um, some discussion and, and certainly as I say, feel free to, to join in at other times too. So I'm going to share my screen to start. All right, so hopefully you can see them now. So uh, the title of my presentation uh, tonight is Living in the Space Between Integrating the Creative Arts and Palliative Care. And I, I have um, given this a lot of thought, not just regarding my own uh, work in, in palliative care, but also where, where we tend to live in space and, and where do you find yourself? Uh, I think there's so many things in our world right now that are dichotomizing our positions or polarizing our positions. And it's very difficult sometimes to be in a place where you can see both sides, you can see multiple sides. Often we're asked to make a choice. And so the ability to stay within a space that allows you to see different perspectives, entertain different viewpoints, um, actually takes a lot of um, energy, but also it's, it's sort of a, uh, in psychology, we talk about cognitive dissonance. It actually puts us in an uncomfortable place. And so for me, I've realized over probably a good part of my career, it's a place that I tend to migrate to more often than not. And so I hope to share some of that with you tonight, but also for you to think about where do you live in space and where do you find your your comfort zone if you want to call it that so just before i get uh, into the actual presentation i want a, a few disclosures I'm, I'm not an art therapist i have taken art therapy courses and workshops and all of the artwork and stories that i'll be sharing tonight i have permission to do so and so i'm really very grateful to um the patients families and staff who have been um, able to share their work artwork with me. Uh, part of the work that I'm going to share with you tonight is from a program called Tile Tales. 
that was initiated by Dr. Marilyn Hundleby. She is a psychologist who started the program at the Cross Cancer Institute. If any of you have been there, um, you may have had the wonderful opportunity to see some of the tiles that are on there, just on display throughout the hospital. And we, uh, with Marilyn or Dr. Hundleby's help, we were able to start this program at the Grey Nuns on our tertiary palliative care unit. Dr. Mir Hassini also helped with some initial funding and the Covenant Foundation as well provided ongoing funding. And then I'm also going to draw from some of the uh, work of Dr. Peter May uh, from a workshop that I'd attended in Banff uh, about a year and a half ago, looking at the expressive art therapies as well. So um, before I, I get into the actual presentation, the whole area of, of the creative arts in, in palliative care can, can certainly create a lot of emotional um, uh, responses. Sometimes it may, because of the sensitivity of some of the stories or the artwork, it may trigger some things for people. And that's very natural or normal. But if, if for any reason you're feeling that you um, are you know, experiencing that, feel free to reach out to someone, including myself, if that's at all helpful for you to just think about even what that might be about. So I'm just uh, making that more of a disclaimer. And, and for many people, it's, it's really, uh, I hope, uh, a wonderful opportunity to get a glimpse into what it's like for, for people in palliative care and end of life. So in terms of the objectives, I would like to hopefully by the end of this time together that you'll be able to describe the role of the creative arts and the innovative art therapy techniques in palliative care and at end of life. To understand where the creative arts fit within our interactions with patients and families and to illustrate how the creative arts can be used for staff support and particularly self-care and it's something that I have used in, in many ways to help with my own wellness and, and ways of um, maybe coping sometimes with some of the challenges that are inherent within our, our profession but within life generally. So behind every image, there is a story. Um, I could tell you a story about this image. I'm not necessarily going to do so. Uh, it was actually um, just briefly taken uh, on a trip that my husband and I had been on in um, Scotland. It, it was uh, on the, oh, was it Scotland? No, no, it's Ireland. Sorry, on the Cliffs of Moher. <laughs> um, and it was a wonderful um, just time away from, from a conference, actually, that we were going to be going to, and we had a few days to unwind. And there can be lots of stories that could come out of this in terms of, you know, before this image was taken, after it was taken, how the image came to be. But every image does have a story. And I guess it's important for you to think about when you see images, what, you know, what might be a story behind it. And the reason why I bring it up, I, I really like this quote uh, by Dina Metzger, who talks about writing for your life. And she says, perhaps story is the only thing we have at the end of our lives. And it is everything. Sometimes I think, as I've worked with patients and families, there is a, a lot of, I guess, need to restory the life that they thought they might have had or wanted to have and a way to find meaning in the story that they find themselves in at the time that I'm I was journeying with them and it can be very challenging sometimes to try and find a way to see the meaning in in a life that's being challenged in many different ways but it also helps us look back on our own lives and think about what is my story and, and how, you know, if I were to have to write a story about my life right now, what might that story be? So I'm going to start with my story and I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief, more to give a context for how I got into palliative care, because often that's a question people ask. Usually when I'm at a social event and somebody says, what do you do for a living? I usually start by saying, I work in healthcare. And then they might say, well, what, you know, what kind of work do you do? And I might say, well, I'm a psychologist. And then they sometimes get a little bit uh, in a reserve thinking I can read their mind, which of course I can't. Um, but then they also ask, well, what part of healthcare do you live in? Pardon me, do you work in? And I'll say palliative care. And they, they, often people say, oh, that must be so depressing or that must be really hard. And although I agree that, you know, the area can have its challenges, there are so many other gifts and rewards that come from working in this area that I, I think often it's important to be able to share that story too. Within my story of how did I get to palliative care from a professional perspective, um, I 
initially started my career as a clinical uh, pharmacist. I worked for about seven years in a hospital pharmacy setting and was always drawn. I, I really loved sciences. I, I enjoyed the, the coursework that I took, yet I was also drawn to being with people and listening to their stories, providing them with medication counseling. And I was always pulled between that scientific part of my, my role and then this more humanistic side. And so I decided to continue on with my training and, and went into counseling psychology at the University of Alberta. And in that program, I was then pulled in a different direction where most of the people there were very much on the humanistic side, which was important, of course. But I felt like there was sometimes a um, almost a, not a minimizing of the healthcare system, but but things like sometimes if if we would talk about medication, sometimes some some people were anti-medication, or there was almost this tension I felt between what I saw as the science of health and and the the wellness and well-being of health. And as I continued on through my program, I was struggling to find a place that I could call home. And it wasn't until I started my doctoral internship at the Cross Cancer Institute, uh, where I began to see how, how these different areas fit together and how so much of what I learned as a pharmacist, so much of what I've learned in my background in healthcare, we're now coming together with the clinical uh, areas that I had uh, spent a lot of time training in. And so from there, I continued on working in the area of psychosocial oncology and eventually specialized in palliative care, uh, working on the tertiary palliative care unit at the Cross Camp, pardon me, at the Grey Nuns uh, from about 2007 until about two years ago. So as I was saying to Manisha, I'm not working clinically now. Uh, I still have, I'm still working in palliative care as in my um, academic role in teaching and research and have um, really deeply valued the work that I've done clinically. So a lot of what I'm gonna share with you tonight is based on my clinical experience, but also based on um, the, the, the stories that people have shared with me too. Well, as much as there's a professional story, there's often a personal story that comes with uh, any experience. And I also have another story, I guess, as to how I got into palliative care. And this story is sometimes I, I don't always share with everyone, depending on who I know or who the person might be. But it is really a fundamental part of how I think I came to be where I am today. Um, what, before I talk about this, this picture is actually a picture of my mom and dad when they in their engagement, uh, gosh, many years ago now. But when I think back to my growing up years, I grew up in a very small community about two hours northeast of Edmonton in a small village. Um, I think back about, you know, how did I learn about death and dying? Well, if you live in a farm, you learn a lot about death and dying through the animals, through the cycles of the season. And although I didn't live on a farm, I, I lived in, in, in the village, I, I did have a sensitivity certainly for the cycles of life. But it, it wasn't until I think I was in grade nine at the time, I might have been 14, where we had a, a traumatic loss for the entire community when four young men uh, were killed in a car accident just outside of our, our small community. Um, and it was the experience of coming back the next day to the classroom and seeing this empty desk that I began to wonder about, you know, what life is really about. And probably the hardest part of it all, it was, I mean, tragic for the families involved and also for an entire community that was grieving, but didn't really have a way or mechanism for how to work through that grief. Even in the schools, we didn't have counselors who came into the school. We, we didn't have, uh, you know, the opportunity to have some sort of um, school, let's say assembly where we could get together and, and share the, the grief that we were all experiencing. And so it, it left a, an impression on me for, for a long, long time in terms of how those early experiences of loss influence our experiences of grief and loss as, as we grow into adulthood. And certainly as I grew into adulthood, perhaps the two people who taught me most about, most about um, life and love and death and dying were my two parents, both of whom had palliative care towards the end of their life. My dad, um, had a, a long-standing history. He was a, he was a school teacher, and incredibly bright, and unfortunately had to uh, leave 
school teaching early due to um, a longstanding history of depression that became difficult for him to um, manage within the classroom. He eventually went on to develop um, an early onset dementia in his early 60s and then died about 10 years later. And in his last year of life, when my mom was no, able, no longer able to um, look after him at home, our family doctor in the same community where I grew up admitted my dad to the hospital. And he, he was there for the full year uh, where my mom could come and visit him after school because she also was a school teacher where we could come and visit on weekends as opposed to having him perhaps transferred to a um, nursing home, the closest one might've been 30, 40 miles away. And it was our family doctor who probably delivered everybody in the community at the time, because uh, he had practiced there for over 50 years, had provided the most incredible palliative care I could ever have imagined. And also everybody in the community who supported my mom and our family. Now, I never knew that was palliative care. I never used the words palliative care. And, and yet it is a form of palliative support that we all experience that I will carry with me always. My mom you know, moved to the city shortly after um, my dad had passed away. And within three years, uh, she unfortunately was diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. It was a routine colonoscopy because we had a history of colon cancer in our family. Her sister had died the year before from uh, rectal cancer. And so it was recommended that she have um, colonoscopy as well. And so by the time they actually diagnosed it, she unfortunately was not curable. And so for the following year of her life, for the last year of her life, we lived our lives as well as we could. My mom wanted us to live life as normally as possible and did not want to make any changes to our lives uh, as a result of her being uh, ill. And in the last probably one or two months before she died, we had palliative home care, uh, which became a source of hope for us uh, after being told, you know, there was nothing more that could be done for her. It, at the Cross Cancer Institute, she was looked after at home by an amazing team. Uh, I still remember the day the, the palliative home care nurse came in and introduced herself. And from a place of where we felt quite hopeless and, and very much I guess alone in this journey, she came and provided all kinds of resources and support and really hope for our, us and our family. And my mom, uh, based on her wish, uh, did die at home um, shortly after that, it, 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 which would be about almost 32 years ago now, a little over 32 years ago. Two different, very, two very different stories of palliative care, equally as important in terms of how they informed my um, experience. My, I, I think I was about 27 when my dad died and I was 32 when my mom died. And I remember thinking, I feel like an orphan now. Like it was an odd feeling, uh, you know, as an adult to feel like you no longer had that buffer of support that was there, always there to, to be there for us from one generation to the next. But they had given us all so much that we could carry forward in our lives um, that it helped me in terms of beginning to recognize this is an area that I, because we had benefited so much from our experience that I wanted to become more involved in and subsequently became much more involved in both the area of uh, oncology and palliative care. So I'm just gonna stop for uh, a few minutes and I'm going to just have you think about um, how your experiences maybe with death, dying and end of life issues might have impacted you professionally and or personally. If there were a story that goes along with that, what would be your story? And also, if there is an image that comes to mind that represents your story, what might that image be? And there, there will be no obligation to share. This is for you to just take a few minutes to reflect. I am going to come back to this at the end of um, kind of the, the presentation where we can talk a little bit about this and, and not even so much as the content as, a, as much as what it's like to think about this. But for now, just I'm going to turn my camera off for about three or four minutes and just give you some time. And if you want to turn your cameras off, you can too. And just take some time to reflect on, on maybe your own experiences too.
Okay, if it's okay, um, are we okay to go on? Is there anybody who still needs a little more time? I'm gonna accept the silence as an okay. <laughs> Could have had you turn your videos back on when you're ready to come back, but uh, I realized giving you five minutes is very unfair because it's a, a, a area that I, I guess I'd encourage you to, to come back to this. And if, if you could give a title to your story, if you decide to write a story, then please um, consider that as well. And, and we will come back to this later. I, I, hope, I hope to do that too. So um, moving from there, I, I guess the creative arts, I mean, encompasses a wide range of modalities and I'm going to focus a lot on visual image and writing. And we'll talk a little bit about the distinctions in the, in the creative arts. So that's more of a focus for tonight. Recognizing, of course, this could be a very broad uh, topic. But when I think about imagery and, and how we find images, similarly like um, you know, the question I asked is, is, is there an image that represents your story? I, I think of Emily Carr, who through really all of her painting shared her love of Vancouver Island, which is where she lived most of her life. And this is a quote that she had about how picture, a picture is really an express thought for the soul. How it's through imagery that we're able to express ourselves. And that really is a large part of what art therapy and art work is about. And I, I often um, you know, think about the question, you know, how, how can you um, maybe find the inner artist inside of you to help express your soul, or, you know, and often it's, it's a very challenging area. When I use the creative arts and in, in working with um, patients and families, one of the first things if I were to, you know, bring up the idea of, of considering this approach, they'd say, well, I, I can't draw, or I'm not artistic, or I'm not an artist. And we all carry these messages with us. And it's interesting even to think about where those messages come from. But it, it does make me think about how as children, we don't seem to have, or children don't seem to have that kind of hesitation. And an example is, you know, if you ask a, a group of young children, these might be kindergarten children, can anybody sing? Everybody puts up their hand. If I were to ask everybody here tonight, can anybody sing? I mean, maybe some people will put up their hand. If often when I've asked this question in a large group, uh, most people don't put up their hand because they know I can't sing. Of course, everybody can sing. Not everybody thinks perhaps they can sing well, but, but it's an interesting thing how when we're young, we have this incredible spontaneity and in, innocence and somehow it gets lost along the way. And I, I really like this quote by Joseph Boyer, who himself was an artist, talking about what it means to be an artist. And for him, every human being is an artist, uh, what he called a freedom being. And it's that, that we're all called to transform and reshape um, the conditions, how we think, and how we structure things in our lives. And being an artist can be being creative in cooking. It can be creative problem solving. There are lots of ways of being an artist that we sometimes pigeonhole into a certain way of thinking about what being an artist is. So I'm just going to leave that for you to, to think about. So just a really quick uh, overview, as I say, I'm, I will give uh, my slides to anybody who would like them to give you a bit of an idea that the creative arts generally is, is a huge area. So it's more than just drawing and painting. Uh, it can include things like, like writing, photography, music, dance, drama. It, it's a very wide range of modalities that could be used to help people access yeah, that. Can you just walk in the room? Sorry, I'm just getting some feedback there. Maybe somebody has their mic uh, on not muted, if you don't mind muting it. Um, and then the difference between creative arts therapy and expressive arts therapy, which you may also hear about sometimes, and the creative arts is really where each discipline has their own unique expertise. So you might have seen uh, music therapists or art therapists or drama or movement therapists. They, they've developed specific areas of, of specialty versus an expressive arts therapist is someone who actually offers more than one modality. And they're actually expressive arts therapy programs you can take if you really were interested. 
So as I said, we're going to focus on art therapy or, or art and art work. And I just want to give a really brief review of this because I think it's important to recognize that although the, you know, the, the term came, I think, initially in 1938, really out of um, you know, psychoanalytic theory, it was used a lot in mental health and therapeutic art education. Art, the concept of art for healing is really very ancient and universal and these cave drawings are a good example where that was a way that people communicated and tried to express themselves way back in in long long ago times and so when i talk about art and therapy it's it's not about creating a beautiful product uh it's really more about trying to find ways to develop and express an image from within and for me and for many people who work in this medium, it's really about, or this modality, it's, it's about understanding the person and the process of art making, which is much more important than the out, outcome of it all. And it, it hopefully takes a lot of the pressure off of people who feel, well, if I can't make a beautiful painting or sculpting, then I don't want to do the work or the artwork. But it, that's not what it's about. It's really about this process. And so it's all about what the image is in the eye of the beholder, what this image means to the person who created it, and also what it means to the person who is appreciating it. And together, those things can be very powerful for healing. In terms of palliative care, there, there have been some great, uh, I think, strides in this area. Initially, this is the Art Therapy Journal, which is the, from the Journal of the uh, American Art Therapy Association. And in 1993, there was a special issue dedicated to art and medicine. So this is over 25 years ago, people were beginning to look at where art fits within the medical field. And 12 years ago, 15 years after that initial publication, they did a special issue in art therapy and palliative care. So it is something that is well recognized in the field and certainly has a lot of value. And these are just some books that are actually written now uh, that are specifically dedicated to art therapy. This was an interesting project. It came out of a conference that it's the European Association of Palliative Care who asked people um, to submit photographs of sort of what what is uh, an image of palliative care for you I guess that was the the question or something to that effect and these were just some of the examples there were these you can actually find these online if you want to look at all of them as to how people try to depict palliative care um, I really to me this image speaks so so much about that space between in some ways but it could be many other things for me that's one one thing that i resonate with but it could be something totally different for yourselves this picture actually comes from calgary uh it was kind of neat to find out that it was uh somebody who actually had the opportunity to have um this this horse uh come and visit her while she was in the hospital in terms of the benefits um there and this is part of my, I guess, my continual need to integrate the science with the art or science with the, the, the humanistic part of my work is trying to understand, you know, the so what question. So what if we do this art? Does it really make a difference? And there's some really good uh, literature. Again, this is more for those people who may have the interest to pursue this further, to look more into it about some of the benefits. These are just a, you know, cloud, um, word cloud that I put together about the many different things that it can uh, have in terms of its impact and they're actually this is just another way of expressing a lot of these um, studies that have been done that actually shows evidence for patients particularly in symptom relief and then in terms of enhanced psychosocial spiritual issues so it it really does make a difference and it's important to know that the work can show we have evidence to support that as well Equally important, we have evidence to show that it can affect and it, it impact families and staff. For families, decreased stress and anxiety or increasing positive emotion. And for staff in particular, it can help with decreased burnout, stress, stress and death anxiety. And this is really a, an important part, I think, of the work that I have done in this area that many of my colleagues have. And many people work in other healthcare settings, not just palliative care, but many different aspects of med medicine and other areas in healthcare. That there are benefits, and there are also not necessarily costs, but there are 
ways that our reserves can be depleted. And we need to constantly think about how can we replenish that well, if we want to call it that, or that reserve, so that we can come back and provide the care that people need. And so the creative arts, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of, of how we've used that with staff as well uh, as a way of in promoting that for staff wellness. Dr. Nikolichuk. Yes, uh, we just have a couple of questions in the chat. I just wanted to bring them up to you. Um, so the first one was if we could just have a definition of palliative um, and that uh, Rosemary believes that it's not necessarily just when death is imminent, but how we are understanding it together. So if you could just speak to that. Excellent question. I would have thought I could have put that in sooner. So I'm glad that uh, Rosemary brought that up. Palliative care, we, we often talk about palliative care and end of life, which is in the objectives I, I had both. And the reason being is that palliative care can occur in some cases, we're now suggesting much earlier on in the trajectory of a person's illness. So some people have suggested even upon initial diagnosis, um, if someone has been given either a poor prognosis or potentially even for people who have need for symptom control, but not necessarily have a terminal or incurable condition. Palliative care also is not just for cancer patients who, or people with cancer, which we often think, but it's also for anybody with a, a chronic life limiting illness. So uh, cardiac issues, uh, diabetes, uh, stroke, ALS, movement disorders, Parkinson's disease, any condition, when, when you think about it, it's a lot of chronic conditions that are not curable, particularly as people progress and need more support in terms of symptom control and quality of life issues. So the World Health Organization has an actual definition for palliative care and talks about this providing supportive care to patients and families from early on in the trajectory of their illness to end of life. And part of that is not is symptom control, but it's also providing better quality of life for people as well. And so a lot of the, the work that we do in our palliative care program in Edmonton uh, is very diverse in terms of different settings. And I think depending on the setting, we can provide up to 25 to 30%, 40% of the care is actually for non-cancer patients. Does that hopefully answer? Rosemary, does that help? Or did you have any other questions about that? Thanks, that does help. Okay, thank you for that question. And then there was another one. Yes, the second question is from Kathy. Uh, how would you define death anxiety? So death anxiety is that deep existential angst, if I can use that word, that comes out of um, existentialism actually originally. It's the awareness that we all are um, have a finiteness to our lives. And for some people that, you know, day to day, we tend not to think about that. We, you know, our lives are very much patterned in, in ways where we're moving forward, thinking about, uh, you know, things we're hoping for. For some people, particularly when they are given a, a maybe a, a prognosis of a terminal condition or incurable condition, an awareness that perhaps their lives, that they may not live till 80, that they may not have the kind of life they had hoped, that they then begin to have fear more around the, the experience of death and dying. And so it's, it's, for some, it's a fleeting feeling. It comes and goes. For others, it can be quite pervasive and it can actually be quite debilitating. And so it's trying to help people work through that in a way that can help them move forward, recognizing in my belief, you know, we, we live till the very last breath of our lives and we can be hopeful to the very last breath of our lives. And we, we hopefully can find ways to find meaning in our lives in spite of the challenges that, that we might be given in terms of a certain kind of prognosis. So, that can sometimes carry over the, that pervasiveness of, of that fear of, of, of dying can be also experienced by staff and healthcare providers. Uh, sometimes it's related to uh, our own experiences. 
sometimes it can be, um, for example, I think of someone whose parent died when, when this person's parent was 55 years old. So when this person became, became 55, when this person turned 55, he also had this kind of sense that perhaps this was going to happen to him too. And because it was a cardiac death, it was something that, that was there and he had to really work through this in a way to help him move, move in a way that said, this isn't necessarily going to happen to you. But we're all kind of working through this based on, I guess, our own experiences as well. You're welcome. That's a great opportunity for questions. Are there any other questions before we move into the next segment? I, I can't see the chat box, so I'm going to have to rely on Manisha to help me out with that. Yeah, no questions so far. Just a comment from Jessica. Um, she says, I'd agree palliative care can be considered an added layer of support useful when living with serious illness at any time in illness trajectory. And then in quotations, the whole person care uh, morality acknowledgement. Yes, More great. <laughs> Thank you. Acknowledgement, yeah. And, and it's a really good point because maybe just to add to that, what, what's happened with the word palliative care is that people do associate it with end of life. And so if someone is referred for palliative care support, or if um, you know we have someone admitted to our unit, for example, our, which is the tertiary palliative care unit at the Green Nuns Hospital, sometimes people didn't wanna come or they didn't want to see someone because they assumed that meant that they were dying as opposed to thinking about palliative care as, as another form of support that is part of an integrated program across all kinds of disciplines. Some programs have actually changed the name from palliative care to supportive care because of that. And I, I think others have really you know, argued or, or defended the word or the way of thinking about it to say it's really about supporting people through their, their journey at, with whole person care, which I really like that uh, comment that was made as well. So uh, we're gonna move into something uh, as well about looking at some of the actual art therapy techniques. And I'm going to show uh, a video in a few minutes so that um, gives you just a chance to think about some of these images. And then we're gonna look at some images in particular and just get your in, in, input in terms of your sort of initial reaction to some of them. Uh, I'm going to share a few first that are not related to the Tile Tales program. This, this is a, a collage that was put together by a woman that I was seeing on our tertiary palliative care unit. And sometimes when we ask people to draw an image of your pain or draw an image of your anxiety, that's really hard. Uh, and it, it's sort of, um, especially if you give them a blank piece of paper and just say, here, draw. It, you know, you need to find ways to help people get have a language or have a, a way of expressing themselves. And one way that's sometimes safer and easier, particularly to people feel, you know, they carry the, some of the different messages about artwork is collage, because what you can do is you just give people a, a few magazines to go through and just ask them to pull out images that stand out for them. And this particular uh, person pulled out the, these images on this side were her experience of pain and suffering that she was experiencing. This is where she felt she was, you know, on our unit. She was beginning to feel like perhaps there was some, her pain was beginning to be better managed. She felt there was perhaps more um, hope in some ways. So she felt she was in this in-between space with a bridge there as well to a place of more hope, uh, you know, where she talked more about life is for living. And so this was a way for her to express herself in, in a very um, unique way that made sense for her. She similarly was able to do this through, this is mandalas. This is uh, one example of a mandala expression. There, there are lots of ways of doing mandalas, but a way of expressing her feelings. And so again, you know, if, I, if you said, well, draw your anxiety or, or draw your fear or draw your pain, it can be harder to do, but if you can ask the person, you know, are, is there a way that you can express how you're feeling about your anxiety or can you express what's really troubling you? Um, another question that's been asked, um, you know, can you draw 
something that expresses what's brought you here, or what's brought you here today to see me. And so in this particular case, she was able to draw one image, which for her, she described more as troubling. It was more about the pain she was experiencing. And this was done, uh, I can't read the, the exact dates on there, but it was done um, uh, about five days before this image was then drawn, which she then began to see more possibility and happiness. And she saw this more as a color for drawing because she was having a potential, there was a potential she was going to be able to go home. And so it just helped her in terms of her mood. So it's an example of how you can help people express some of their, um, their mood as well. This is an example of someone uh, that I worked with using acrylic. So uh, the medium of, of the artwork is all, or the art is also important. And I know from my own personal experience, there's certain kinds of media that I'm more comfortable with than others. Uh, acrylics are reasonably good for using in hospital, though, though they can be a bit messy, so you have to think about that if depending where you're working. This particular gentleman um, had a, a profound um, tumor. It, it was so large, it, it had grown into his arm, to the, in his right arm, to the point he, he couldn't use his arm anymore. And he was right-handed. Uh, his way of coping was often to you know, go out for a smoke, uh, to uh, do things. He was, he was certainly what we call an instrumental griever in terms of how he dealt with some of his, his losses. And when it came to a point where he was no longer able to go outside, um, he became bed bound in, in a sense. He then took to artwork as a way to help him with his pain relief and distraction. And he learned to, he'd never painted before. He learned to paint with his left hand. And these are some of the images that he created. And he never played, worked with acrylics before either. And so we spent a lot of time really talking about art and, and creating through artwork. I can't say that we talked a lot about some of the issues that were there that were deep, perhaps inside that he was wrestling with, but we didn't need to. He found a way to work through a lot of that in his own way, but also use the artwork as a way to help him find meaning in the time that he had. And in the end, though it wasn't his initial intent, he gave these away to his family as legacy gifts. And so it became a, a great opportunity for him to do that too. So the next part of this um, uh, presentation, I'm gonna talk a little more about the Tile Tales program where we're gonna look at some specific tiles and that's where I'm gonna get you to interact with them and, and give me some of your impressions of the artwork. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a program, as I say, that Dr. Marilyn Hundleby had initiated at the Cross Cancer Institute. And it's essentially drawing an image. And for the patients, I often say something that's meaningful to you, maybe something that represents your experience of what you're going through right now. Um, often it's, it's an image that they have had, or they find an image that makes sense for them. Sometimes they draw it freehand, other times they find something on, you know, uh, online, or they draw it, find it from a magazine, and they can trace it. And so uh, they, they draw the image on the tile, they paint it. These images you see here of the mom and her uh, daughter are what they look like after they finish the painting. These are ceramic paints. They're then sent for glazing. And so the actual finished product looks quite a bit different than what the actual painting is. And um, in many ways, this has probably been the most gratifying part of my work is being, I guess, witness to the types of experiences people have shared as a result. And very much for me, it's the process of creating and being with the person that's as important as the, the product. What they're able to do afterwards, and I'll show you some images, is they often have a, a title or a story that goes with the image. These are, for the most part, if people would like them, they're displayed on an acrylic frame and they are put on uh, walls throughout our unit and on the hallway coming up to our unit at the Greenlands Hospital. So not only do they create something for themselves, often they give these away as legacy gifts for in some cases, other times um, the public display is as important for them to leave uh, something behind for the unit too. So just to give you a, a flavor for some of the tiles that are there, I'm going to uh, just go through this video. It's about six minutes or so. 
and then I'll come back with the slide presentation and we'll look at some more in more detail. So hopefully I can figure this out. We'll just, I'll stop sharing for a bit and start the video in a couple seconds, I hope.
Okay. So um, we'll move on to the actual opportunity to look at some of these in a little more um, detail. Any, any comments maybe before we move into that? Oh, I just thought you did a, it was a beautiful job of the tiles and I thought the pacing was really wonderful because it was slow enough for us to take it in. And I liked how they wove, you know, animals, uh, nature sounds in with the music, like so there's the steadiness of the music. Anyway, aesthetically, it was a really beautiful experience. And, you know, anyway, the, the, the curation was really beautiful. So yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, we, we, we have another version that actually has lyrics to go with it, which we've, we've used um, in another format or another venue, but I, I find uh, the, anytime you have lyrics and, and images, it, it kind of sometimes takes away from the image. So this uh, provided more of an opportunity for that. So I'm glad that was um, something that you felt worked well. So as we look at these images, I just want you to use these three prompts about, you know, what do you see, what do you feel, and what do you imagine? And this comes out of the work from Peter May from uh, this expressive arts therapy workshop that I had attended. And so um, we'll look at, at an image and then I'll, I'll open up for, for brief discussion and then I'll share the story that goes with the image. But initially, I'm just going to show the, the, the image itself. So this is the first image. So what do you see? What do you feel? And what do you imagine? We have I see a rooster in the chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it reminds me of a Portuguese rooster, the ones that they have. So it makes me instantly think of my father and his love of puri puri chicken. <laughs> like... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so his love of, did you say? I think it's puri puri chicken. There's a Portuguese chicken that's really delicious. Ah. In Montreal, they had it on the St. Lawrence, Maine. But that to me is, you know, so to me, it's like a Portuguese Canadian kind of the culture, like, and then holding sort of aspects of a person's life or yeah, or whatever inside of it. But to me, I, I really, I don't know, it, it seems, you know, that's what it speaks to me of. Like a culture and then individual and emotions and mixed emotions too. Like the bull is the ground, you know, angry and then the little teddy bear. Anyway. And I see music. Okay. You see music, okay, great, yeah. We have a, um, I feel my mom close and I imagine health and happiness. And uh, from Dr. Brett McLean, she says, it suggests for me a couple's hope for the future for their young family. Okay. Great. Uh, just for clarity, there is an ace of spades here at the bottom, which when I took this photograph of the tile, it was obviously reflected poorly on the, on the photo. But um, that is another piece of this image. But what we'll do, if that's OK, unless there are any other comments, okay. uh, we'll move on to the actual story that goes with this tile. Um, there, there's actually a longer story to this. I, I won't uh, read it all out. But this was a, a tile that was put together by a family. And in the name of the title of the tiles, Our Family's Cancer Story. Um, this was a young woman uh, that I met on our unit who um, I think touched all of us deeply in so many different ways. And the actual tile, as I say, was, was conceptualized and written together as a family. Um, the Rooster is Portuguese, as uh, Kathy had said, so it, it comes from their, their heritage. They were both, both parents were born in Portugal. And um, the teddy bear in the middle is, is the patient, Kayla, who unfortunately uh, was diagnosed with cervical cancer at a very young age in her early 20s, initially given a clear bill of health or clear um, condition, and then did develop, uh, go on to develop metastatic cancer and um, did die on our unit. And so 
she was always called uh, Little Bear was, was what her parents called her. And so that's the bear that is represented in, in this area. The music note represents the mom, Natalia, who always loved music. And for her, it, it was something that transcended, you know, culture, sexes and races. So she, she was very much connected to, to the musical part in her life. The bowl was, her, was uh, Kayla's dad, Tiberio. And, um, you know, it was a symbol of virility, power, confidence, and strength. And the Ace of Spades was actually uh, Natalia's boyfriend. Both parents, both parents, the parents uh, were divorced, but had an incredible relationship with Kayla and uh, were there for her every step of the way. And Benjamin, who was Natalia's boyfriend, equally had a place to, to, to be in this in this in this very very tragic time of life and for him ace of spades was nobility spiritual wisdom and acceptance i actually sat with benjamin who created who painted the tile after natalia pardon me after kayla had died uh, they never had a chance to finish this before she died so she never got to see it but she knew about and saw the actual drawing and uh it it actually was um like a, almost a grief the session for, for Benjamin, who similarly had the opportunity to talk about his experience uh, as seen through, through the drawings here. So it was a very, uh, each, each tile, I mean, there, there's, there's a whole process that comes from within each tile and it's hard to actually capture it all, but that is one, one example for sure of that one. All right, um, I'm gonna move on to the next one. So what do you see? What do you feel and what do you imagine? I see um, a lot of adventure with uh, the riding on a boat and perhaps the arrow um, mixed in, of course, with um, some of the sort of dark clouds and it looks like in the bottom right pane that the boat might be cracking. Um, uh, yeah. I think there's one in the chat too that I'll read here. Um, Debbie says, a child's broken heart. Hmm. Oh, up here maybe, okay. Okay. Any other comments? So th this was a tile that was painted by uh, four grandchildren. Um, the fifth grandchild, this is the fifth grandchild's drawing. He couldn't be there. He was at summer camp, but he wanted to really be a part of this. So um, the mom had a drawing that he had given he had her to draw for him. And uh, they each had their own square. And one of them was quite little. So he, he got to do his own little painting. And I'm always fascinated with children especially small children, what colors they choose. Like they, they're often really bright and colorful. He did put a little black cloud in there. I don't, well, black cloud. Now I'm interpreting that a black spot. <laughs> Is it a black, you know, what does that mean? It may not mean anything. Maybe he just picked up the black color, but regardless, it was a wonderful opportunity for these children to get together and have an opportunity, not just to draw something for the grandfather, but also to reminisce about who he was and what he meant to them. He, he used to go fishing with uh, his grandchildren a lot and that's where the boats come in for, for them. And uh, these tiles, once there is this, this tile is on public display, but each of the grandchildren received a copy of the tile to keep as a keepsake for uh, memory for, the, for their grandfather. And what they had, the name of the tile they gave it was never forgotten. And I won't read all of this to you. Uh, it's, it's really a tribute to who their grandfather was. And um, the oldest granddaughter, Taylor, wrote him a poem as well, which is at the top there about um, how much she will miss him, but how much she will always remember him too. So that was um, a wonderful opportunity for me. It, it was a, a real gift. And I think there were, you know, with the four children, anything, there was two or three moms in the room, I can't remember now, who would be the daughters of the grandfather. The grandfather wasn't present. 
it was it was a full room. It was a busy room, but it, it was uh, just a wonderful opportunity for me to be a part of that experience. Okay, here's uh, the third one. Uh, what do you see? What do you feel? And what do you imagine? For me, um, when I was watching the videos go by, this one actually struck me. Um, and what I saw, I guess, was I saw this person had included kind of in a fire, almost like a protective fire, it looked like for me. Um, someone had put their heart in here, someone had put a bear's paw and even a, an eagle or some sort of predatory bird. And it felt like this person was was collecting these symbols for them and it felt very strong. This person was putting a lot of strength into this particular tile and it, it was very striking and it was very moving for me. And I could, I almost tried to imagine what this person looked like and, and how they might've been feeling when they're composing this. I found it was very impactful. Hey, thanks, Timber. That's, that's uh, wonderful that you were able to see all of that, to even pull it out of the, the multitude of tiles that you saw in the video. Um, Dr. Brett McLean says, I see a loving relationship between two strong people committed to each other to love and life. Okay. And Rosemary says, I thought of the circle being pain. And, and we all have our um, own appreciation and, and interaction with an image. So it, it will draw us in, it will move us in different ways. And so it, it's wonderful to hear, you know, in, in a small group uh, that, that we are tonight, you know, we each have our own way of connecting with an image. And that's so, so important um, with any of the images that we might see or with ones that we might create ourselves too. Uh, any other comments before I move on? Um, Rosemary added, perhaps um, escaping the pain via the eagle. Okay. Great. All right. Um, this tile is entitled My Five Boys, and it actually is um, each symbol on the tile represents one of the patient's children. Uh, she had given each of her boys um, a Cree name. And you'll see for each boy, and this is the Cree, the way it's written in Cree, um, one is bear paw, the other is sky, eagle, ring of fire, and heart. For herself, she had her name here, but she didn't actually, she was not really in this image, which is interesting in, in many ways. Um, when I worked with um, Monica and her, she's given her name so I can use her name. Um, it took us almost three months to create this tile. And I always worried that she would never finish it. Um, it seemed like she really wanted to do it. And yet there was something that was creating, you know, challenges for her. Some of it was her pain. Sometimes, you know, she did develop a delirium. So there were lots of, there were lots of reasons for it, but I, I always thought what, what would happen if we couldn't finish it, but she did. Um, and uh, she did remarkably well. At the time when she painted this tile, she was estranged from all of her children. So she had not seen them for a long time. And so it was her way of wanting to connect with them and also to give them a gift for her, for the, her to be remembered by them. And again, this was, uh, we made five copies for each of her boys and they each received a tile, I hope because we gave it to her uncle who then passed it on to them. So we didn't actually meet the boys, at least I never did. Uh, but it was it really important for her to, um, to have this ability to do something for them. She was also had some, you know, uh, strain with her relationship with her, her mom and her mom would come and visit. And, and sometimes the, the interactions weren't always as maybe um, conciliatory or, or uh, satisfactory as they both hoped but while they were while she was doing this her mom said I'd like to do a tile too and so her mom did the infinity symbol which you may have noticed on the, the video I don't have it here as an example and it was 
so powerful to see the two of them sitting together, creating art together, each on their own project, um, and actually connecting in a, in a very meaningful way. And for me, that's been a lasting memory of, of how the artwork brought them together and allowed them to move beyond any kind of maybe difficulties to actually be able to share some very special memories. So I've got a, a couple more, but I think what I what I will do, um, I'll just kind of go through them. I'm, I'm aware of the time. I, I do want to allow some time for, for a discussion, and I don't want to take up a, a lot of time just for um, the PowerPoint presentation. Sometimes that inhi inhibits things as much as it can help. So I, I will move on, unless there are any other comments on this particular tile. Oh, OK. So here's another one. Uh, and you know, for yourself, you can think about those same questions. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you imagine? Um, and just uh, for the sake of, of time, I'll just give you, a, I hate to just rush through an image. It seems very unfair <laughs> to just kind of, here it is and then move on. But um, it is uh, a tile that was painted. It was painted by uh, the patient. And it was the mom who wrote the story. And at the time when the patient was going to sit down and, and do this tile, she was really, really nauseated. She even said, I don't even know if I'm going to do this today. I don't feel good. And her mom encouraged her, says, well, just come and sit in, because we had a, a separate room where they could sit at, at a table. And she says, well, just come and see how you feel. And so for two hours, um, while they drew the image and, and the patient painted it, they sat and they reminisced and talked about so many special times that they had um, with trips they'd taken as, as a mother daughter. It was again, another example of, of being part of an experience, a snapshot of a relationship that was extremely uh, powerful. And so her mom, it, they called it In My Heart and her mom actually wrote the story. So um, the patient Martine drew the image and painted it while her mom wrote the story. And so it just says in the car on the way to the Grey Nuns Palliative Unit, my daughter Martine took my hand and said, don't be sad, mom. This poem from a poem is, is like reminds me of us. And so I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. We'll always be together. And so it was a very um, important time for the two of them to be able to connect in that way. And the last one, this one, a little bit of a busier tile, but um, similarly, what do you see and what do you feel and what do you imagine? And I'll read the words to you because <laughs> it might be a little hard. Um, eight more is great. Nine years would be fine. Forget about your worries and your strife. Do the walk of life. When I, uh, and again, what do you see, what do you feel, and what can you imagine? Um, when, when this was done together with a, um, a mother and a daughter, and it was the daughter's father, the, the I'm going to get this all mixed up here, the, the husband and wife, uh, the, the husband was a patient on the unit, the wife was in the room, and so was their daughter, okay, so just the wife and the daughter were in the room. And um, they had originally hoped to do this, actually Eddie, who's at the bottom here is the name of the patient, had hoped to do the tile before he died, but unfortunately he became quite ill and was not able to do so. So um, his wife and their daughter came and asked if they could do it afterwards. So it was really more of like, like a grief session for them. And when the daughter first showed me the image, I said to her, you know, she showed me the drawing and I said, that's, that's, pretty complicated, especially writing that way, you know, that most people, if you work in this medium, you'll find that the paint is really lumpy, and it, it's not easy to work with. Well, she had a degree in fine art, so what did I know? <laughs> but she taught me actually a lot about drawing and using the art as medium, and so she did a, a beautiful um, piece. And so while she painted, her mom reminisced, and as they did together about um, and she actually openly grieved about the losses that they'd experienced from the time he was diagnosed with cancer to to his end of life and um, just again the story is called Eddie's journey 
And it says here, as last month in the Gray Nuns Palliative Care Unit was in, um, I'm missing, I can't read the entire thing. Uh, anyways, uh, in the hope of another eight to nine years. And one of his favorite songs by Dire Straits, if any of you know it, was called The Walk of Life. It's a great song if, if you haven't heard it. And so he con Ed constantly pushed himself to walk and move to keep life going. He lost his battle that lives on in spirit. He's with us forever. So that was Eddie's journey. Any other, maybe any comments um, before we move on? Um, we had, Debbie had said for the last um, tile that we saw that uh, um, she said gratitude um, was what she noticed. And then in the most recent one, uh, diagnosis. This one will be diagnosis? Yes. This one. Great. Okay. I know I've kind of rushed you on these last two and uh, uh, you, you can certainly uh, come back to them if you decide to use my slides or, or have them, uh, you, you can look through them again and see uh, what kinds of things come for you, come to mind for you. Um, I won't go through this in any detail, only to let you know that part of what we felt was really important was to do an evaluation of the tiles because we wanted to know was it really making a difference and and what if any difference did it make and so we did a, a thematic analysis a analysis of all the tiles there are over 85 of them that are hung on the walls on public display uh, we had given some of the all of the participants in a certain time period surveys to complete and we also have and continue to this day have public surveys so that as people walk around the unit, and a lot of these are off our unit where they're on a hallway where surgical patients can look and see the tiles, there are little uh, surveys that they can complete and put into a survey box. So very quickly, I, I mean, these are um, some of the themes that come through, things like spirituality, journey, relationships, story, and of course, there's some sub themes below each of them. But within each or across all of them, I think there is this symbolism as well as a paradox. Um, the symbolism, as you can see with the tiles we looked at in more detail, there, there's so many things you could see in a, in a symbol. And, and for each of us, like a teddy bear can have a certain you know, impact or meaning um, versus a musical note or um, a heart or, or uh, perhaps a fishing boat with, with two people in it. So, so they all have different, we all have different ways of trying to illustrate our story. But there's also a lot of the tiles had a paradox and I'm not sure as many of the tiles that I showed you today did, but it was sort of this, this being pulled between the, this sort of being in, in, a, in, in one space, but being pulled into another. Um, do any of the tiles for you have a paradox? I'm trying to think. Um, of what I showed you, or any that you might have seen on the um, video. The, the one that, uh, sorry, is there anybody who might have a comment? Nothing no. in the chat right now, no. Okay, so there was there was the one, um, you know, where, where the, there was a tile, it was more on the video, it was sort of a, a tile of, of half the tile was sort of black and there were footprints of walking along, you may or may not remember this tile, sort of being in, in um, the, the journey of having a final, this final part of life. And then the other half of the tile was more light and hopeful. And for this person was, was uh, for, because of her religious beliefs, it was her belief in a life after death. And so these two kind of juxtapositions, half a tile in one space, half in the other, that, that's the one that comes to mind. And, and there are others, I, I just can't think of any at the moment. Um, in terms of, you know, did it make a difference? We asked people a lot of uh, different things all the way from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So this being higher on this end, five would be strongly agree. And most of these uh, items that they were asked to relate to were actually very highly rated above three and a half, if not more. And um, the three highest ones were, you know, it raised my spirits, it helped me express my feelings and it helped me work through my grief. And so that was really gratifying to see. And similarly, we, we looked at some qualitative themes, uh, the theme of gratitude, which came up as someone mentioned, uh, the theme of leaving a legacy, uh, finding meaning and creating tiles together and a theme of connecting with others. And for many people displaying the tile, having it on public display was as important as creating it. 
And this is an example where you'll see a few of them on our walls. This is uh, on the nursing unit itself and how you can see there's a tile with um, the actual stories beneath it. And these are the little public, little, they're, they're small, short public surveys that we have uh, that we ask people to complete. And these are just some comments people make, you know, how the tiles have made my day, they're inspiring to me, we're not alone on this journey. Others, you know, who said they, they were suffering, this person was suffering from stage four cancer, had been on the surgical unit and had to be ambulatory. And so the tile tales were a favorite destination of my family and me. Um, just briefly about support for staff. I, 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 we haven't got a lot of time to talk about it, but it's more about, this can equally be important for staff to do. And uh, I ha we have done workshops, tile painting workshops, the same one. This was created by one of our staff um, to do a similar kind of process. And it was more, I think the question I had them think about was, you know, what is, what, or how has working in palliative care impacted you personally or professionally, uh, though people could do whatever they asked, would like to do in terms of um, the images. Others, you know, there are things like team quilts that have been made, uh, hope trees where you put inspirational quotes on a tree, a thought for the day, and then there are actually some art therapy courses that you can take. And these are some of the tiles that were created by our staff as well. And each of them, of course, has a story to tell. So similarly, um, I don't feel I'm giving them enough justice to just show them to you, but they all have um, really found this, this, this tile in particular, I can just talk about briefly. This, this was done by one of our staff. She used to paint a lot and she hadn't, hadn't painted in years. And uh, after she did this tile, she started painting again. And she said it was just a remarkable opportunity for her to get back into painting. So it was really uh, special to hear how that had actually been, uh, I hope, somewhat of a catalyst to help her get reconnected with that creative part. Um, in the course that I took uh, on art therapy, th these were some of the different activities that, that we did. And um, this is some of the artwork that I had done. And I, I really, um, I took this through St. Stephen's College at the time uh, with Dr. Era Parker. She's no longer there, but a wonderful um, instructor and uh, she's teaching now in the, in the States, um, but has had a, an incredible way of, of engaging us in many activities. And I really struggled with um, the process versus the product. I, I felt you know, overwhelmed by the media. I, I had not worked with a lot of this different kind of media. We were timed often in terms of giving a certain time to finish things. And often I felt like I was needing to let go of what it might look like to simply be in the process. And as I went through the course, I didn't realize it at the time, I ended up um, giving each of them a title and a short reflective um, poem, if you want to call it that. And all of them had to do with grief. And they all had to do with my collective grief of working in palliative care. I hadn't gone into the course doing that. I took the course because I wanted to use it to help me with working with patients and families. And it ended up being an extremely beneficial um, opportunity for me. And it was really about trying to understand what I've talked about the space between how, how we need to think about how we can access this space between, in some cases, it's living and dying, uh, how, how therapy really, it, it doesn't eliminate the suffering, but it gives a voice to it and hopefully creates a space for people to, to create in their own way. And the artwork is a grounding place. It, it's where, where it, it helps hold us. And our task, if not as a therapist or anybody working in this area, is really to help people find a proper container for their pain. And this was an example that uh, I'll just share these and then I'm going to open it up for discussion because I, I don't want to go through um, without giving time for, for everyone to, to share any uh, insights. This was a, an example of one of the um, uh, artwork that I had done and I, I had started first with the meditation, we had an opportunity to, to do that, to get into more of a creative space. And then I just started uh, working with paints. And as I was painting, I realized a, a sadness was coming over me and I couldn't quite figure out what that was about. And 
as I was painting, I realized each color represented a person that I had known along their palliative care journey. And some of the colors were short, some of the paths were short, uh, some were longer, some overlapped, but eventually they all ended. And initially I just kind of ended here and I, I, I remember just feeling really sad. And then I began to think, well, what if, what if some of these colors started to flare out after? What, what if they didn't end? What if there was something more than what we see as end of life? And of course, this is a, you know, everybody has their own beliefs. So I'm not wanting to impose this on anyone. But for me, it had meaning in terms of trying to make sense of all of these people I had met along the way. And this was the, the, the short excerpt that I'd written called Prayer Cycle about, you know, the cycle of life, Godspeed, eternal love, the cycle of life as we know it, complete. Um, and then I, I had an opportunity to do a second um, a follow up to it. Again, it was not something I'd intended, but this for me was sort of like, well, where do those colors go? And perhaps um, they become part of a bigger bigger part of, 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 uh, uh, of something we don't understand or know. Um, and this was called Up Above the Clouds, Take These Wings and Fly Away Up Above the Clouds, Ready for Your Solo Flight. Um, and so I, I further have thought about how other art expressions could be used to illustrate that movement from perhaps where we are now to perhaps another, another plane, whatever it might be. And as I say, this may or may not fit for you in terms of your own beliefs, but for me, it gave me some comfort and it helped me process some of the grief that I was experiencing. So I'm, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to open it up for questions and comments. And um, if you'd like uh, to get back to the reflective ex um, exercise, um, that I gave at the beginning and, and not, you don't have to share the content of it unless you'd like to, um, but you might also just wanna think about what was it like for you to do that reflective exercise. So I'll kind of leave it open for whatever comments or questions you might have. Oh, I'll just get it going because I don't mind. <laughs> I'll just read it a little bit because because I'm a writer, if that's okay. Sure. And I, I just thought that it's easier than talk. I grew up with death, my dad's an estate planner and so full of life and people. As a lawyer, I had to constantly do the math. If you die first, your husband your husband dies first, you both die together. You know, so I got comfortable thinking about death. Um, death didn't bring my family together, but being with the dying helped me find inner strength. My best friend was killed by a drunk driver when I was just 18. I suffered what I came to learn was PTSD uh, uh, decades later. It was as if someone had erased her file from my hard drive every image sound event uh, before there were hard drives. I had two photos and a pencil as talismans of our friendship, which took me to Alberta, Shadow Lake Louise, as a kind of pilgrimage. She was to a waitress at the Bam Springs Hotel that first summer. I wrote her alive through poetry. And in fact, she has always accompanied me in my life as real in my imagination as my friend, as any friend in another city or country. Wow, that's, so. that's beautiful. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Um, very deeply felt. Um, what a wonderful gift to give to your friend to carry on her spirit throughout your life and to share it with us now, to continue to share that. Um, it really resonates with the whole concept of what we call continuing bonds in grief. Often, um, We've been programmed, I think, from a very young age to say we have to end a relationship with the person who's died before we can move on and you know develop new relationships. And that created a lot of tension and stress for people who weren't prepared to do that or weren't able to. And now um, there's been a real shift in how we think about grief and how um, we, we find ways of creating meaning in the loss that we've experienced. We find ways to continue those bonds we find ways to retell the stories in new ways. And they, they are part of us. We, everybody we meet in our life, we, we, every person we, we, we uh, encounter become a part of us in some way. And it's recognizing that and appreciating it and celebrating it in spite of times when perhaps that relationship ended you know, far, far, far sooner than it ever should have. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
we have a comment, um, a few comments in the chat saying thank you to Kathy. Um, and then one that says, thank you, you're painting with lines of various lengths, spoke to how I feel about people that come and go. And the grief of that each time that loss happens through the years, even if it is not through death. Yeah, and that, that's a great um, observation. We, we deal with loss each and every day. And um, a lot of our losses are not necessarily related to somebody dying. They're related to all kinds of changes that occur in our lives. Um, the pandemic of the last year has challenged each and every one of us. We have all had loss, not all the same, uh, not all uh, you know, in the same maybe intensity, but the losses are universal and it's understanding that part of what we need to do is grieve that loss too um, and a big part i know particularly in palliative care where i where i worked uh, particularly on our unit that feeling like there was no time to grieve that what would happen is you know you would have somebody that you would get connected to you would develop a relationship with them sometimes it's very short and then the person died. And sometimes that person might die when you were not there. So you didn't even have a chance to say goodbye. But before you know it, that place where the person had been, that room was filled with a new patient and a new relationship that needed to be initiated. And not just myself, but our staff generally often talked about there's no space, there's no time, there's there's no way to process this before we move on. And I think that's what happens in life generally. We, we have a lot of losses we encounter, there's a lot happening, a lot of changes. And sometimes those changes happen so quickly that we just move on to the next thing and we don't even think about what impact that may have had. So I really appreciate the comment about thinking about loss in a much larger context. In thinking through that thread, the inability to have time or the inability to have space, do you find that in your own personal artistic practice that that grants you that opportunity that almost that almost like you you forge space through art in order to to deal with some of those losses or deal with some of the professional or personal losses? It, it certainly helps. Um, I actually do a lot of writing. Um, almost more so than the artwork. Um, I do some artwork. I do a lot of photography as well. And that's where I find I can find a space to try to make sense of that. Um, about a year and a half ago, when I decided to move out of my clinical role and um, go into um, more of my academic work and give up what had been, you know, an incredibly... Um, incredible time in my life. I had a whole summer where I walked in the river valley and almost every day. And I, I didn't take a notebook with me. I took my iPhone and I would take photographs and I would dictate into my iPhone just something that would come to me. And um, it was all about the transition that I was going through and the loss I was experiencing. And it was the actual movement through space while I was taking photographs and also um, dictating into my iPhone until it would die, which often would happen with the battery, um, that I then created, and I haven't finished this, but it's really a book about transitions. It's a small book that I'll make for myself. I'm not necessarily gonna give it to anyone, but it was extremely therapeutic. So I guess my, my comment would be yes. Uh, and also for anyone who has the ability or, or interest in this is to find your way, that there isn't one way and there isn't a single way but that it can be profoundly um, helpful, you know, finding, finding yourself in a creative space. I always know when I'm, I'm under stress or when I'm, I'm not functioning at my highest potential is when, I've, when I'm neglecting my creative spirit or the creative pursuits that I have. And that's my red flag that I need to get back into those things. Thank you, that was a, thanks for that question, Timber. Cheryl, it's uh, Jessica, and apologies that all of you had to come with me on my evening routine as I came home trying to listen and also sort the household. But I want to just share um, 55 word stories, which a colleague introduced me to recently. And I don't know if others have used these, um, but they're almost like haikus about your experience with patients because you just have 55 words to capture something 
um, that stuck out to you. And I'm finding that those very therapeutic because they don't take a lot of time. And I think uh, time is so um, uh, fraught or or hard to hard to gather through through a work day. So I found that very helpful. Thank you for mentioning that, Jessica. And nice to hear your voice. Uh, yeah, that, it's a great, I, I took that, I, I learned about that through a brief workshop I took at a conference in Montreal a few years ago, and essentially what they ask you to do is take 10 minutes and just write, write about something that, you know, could be about a loss, could be about something happened in your day, and then after 10 minutes, after you've written, you read it and you synthesize it to 55 words, and that is tough to do, after, you know, when you think about it. Uh, so that's one way you could do it anyways, the way that I, that I had seen it done. And it's, it's really amazing to read, you know, your 10 minute version versus your 55 word version. And uh, I've used this with medical residents actually in um, a narrative um, cell, what is reflective writing uh, seminar that I do with them and have them uh, use it as an opportunity to, to try and, and work from that space to a much more manageable piece. And then if you can, to debrief with someone about it. It was powerful. My, my husband and I took it together and uh, we both found it extremely powerful to share with each other. Even though we've known each other all, all, all our lives, all our married lives, uh, it, it, there was things that came up that we hadn't uh, necessarily talked about before. So it's, it's a wonderful example. So thank you for that suggestion. Do you have some advice for us um, wanting to bring art into um, the clinical spaces? Um, I always feel when I, you know, it's such a beautiful talk and I see those beautiful images and I think, why, why can't all my, the people I see, all my patients have access to this? What, why is it so um, few and far between these, these programs and these things? What, what advice do you have for us as we try to find ways to bring um, such therapies into the space, into the clinical spaces? I get my, my first reaction, and uh, I, I have to give it more thought to, to be complete, but is, is to start small. Um, one of the things we did before we brought, well, actually kind of in tandem with the tile tales is, is we created, um, they're like little art kits. So we put in um, a little package of, well, for children, it could be crayons. For adults, it could be coloring pencils. Uh, we also use some watercolor pencils, a sketch pad. And um, I think we might have had a pencil and an eraser in there and a little um, sharpener. And we just said, you know, if, if you have an interest in this area, this is something we could explore. I'm just going to leave this at the bedside for you. And if you like, you know, I, I can come back and it can be something they can do on their own, but it's also something that you can start with them. If you have a budget, of course, even that can be expensive to, to do those kinds of things, but it, it's one way of, of trying to enter into another way of connecting through the creative arts. Um, I, I still believe art therapists have a significant role to play and, and I, I would love to see an art therapist in every program in palliative care. Um, if that's not within that realm, it's, it's trying to find where your expertise is on your team. And sometimes there are people that have an inclination towards this. Sometimes um, it's a way of helping people develop that. Oftentimes too, it can be, you know, one, one patient who, you may find out is actually quite artistic. And sometimes I've sat down with that person and said, what do you think we need to do to help us bring this onto our unit? And so that was helpful for me to talk to some of our patients to get some, and the families to get some input about what they thought could work. If, if it's an inpatient unit, it's using media that are accessible, easy to use, and don't take a lot of energy because we know that a lot of patients don't have that kind of energy. So, you know, using paints as much as that one example I showed with acrylics was, was one way of doing it. It can be really challenging for people. So maybe it is, it's, it's watercolor pencils and they can dip a, pen, a, a paintbrush into a little bit of water and just get the colors to move on the page. Uh, a lot easier than using watercolor. So, those are a few thoughts that just come to mind, but it, it's a process. Uh, and uh, if you have the interest to um, start small and, and just see where it goes. 
I realize we're getting really close to the hour. I hadn't anticipated taking the full two hours. So I, I'm thinking this maybe might be a good opportunity for us to close. Uh, unless, Manisha, you have anything else that you might like to uh, add? I will. Um, I'll steal the screen from you for a second and just finish up with the last two slides. Sure. OK, so I just wanted and I'm going to check the chat quickly. I see that we have a couple comments there. OK, perfect. I think it's mostly thank yous. Um, I just wanted to put this slide up. Um, we always ask for feedback at the end of each session. Um, we really want to know uh, what your experience was, what you enjoyed, um, ways we can improve, and any questions um, or comments you have at all. So you can scan this QR code with your phone camera, but I'll send out an email to everyone. I find that that's typically easier. And then I did want to just mention that we are running our second fundraiser. Um, and this time we've actually decided to collaborate with local Canadian artists. And so we're producing a limited number of apparel uh, pieces. So t-shirts and long sleeves um, and hoodies as well. And so what we did is we paid um, this artist. So Kieran is our first artist for this program. And so we paid her to create a couple of designs that we've used for these apparel pieces. Um, and then anything that we make from this fundraiser will go towards future obliquity um, programming. So I just wanted to put a plug in, of course, no obligation whatsoever, but wanted to let everyone know. Um, and with that, that's all we have for you. So as, as always, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it means the world to us and we really appreciate um, being able to have these discussions and join together um, during these couple of hours in the evening. So thank you and uh, take good care.